Hi, I'm Luke Sierveld. Welcome to another episode of Meet the Gaffer. Today, we're going to spend some time with the folks that put together the Social Dilemma. Uh, it's a feature documentary now available on Netflix. Uh, we're here with uh, Jeff Orlowski. He's the director. And uh, uh, Larissa Rhodes, she was the producer. And then the DP of the interviews uh, in the film, and that's John Behrens. And then we've got... Um, uh, Jonathan Pope, who is the director of the narrative uh, sequences. And uh, we also have the gaffer of the narrative sequences and some of the interviews, and that's uh, Jason Tahara. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for uh, this, um, for being here, and I'm glad we had this opportunity. Uh, we won't be discussing the content of The Social Dilemma, uh, but suffice it to say, one critic said, that uh, the social dilemma is the single most lucid, succinct, and profoundly terrifying analysis of social media ever created. That was uh, David Ehrlich, uh, which is, um, you know, uh, wow, <laughs> high praise. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, definitely check it out. There are other forums that talk a lot about the content. We're going to talk more about the uh, the craft uh, behind. Uh, that content and, you know, what brings it to life. So if I could start with you, Jeff, um, maybe we go back to the beginning. Uh, so for the overall approach to this piece, uh, were you thinking, were you, your visualization of it, were you thinking that you would combine interviews and uh, uh, narrative pieces and animation and, and uh, you know, even yeah. the, the part with the sort of manipulation, um, mind manipulation, AI, AI thread. Yeah. Was that always um, in, the, in the works? It, it was something that came over time. Uh, first of all, just thank you, Luke, for, for hosting all of us and for having this conversation today. Um, so Larissa, my producer, we, we've worked on a bunch of projects over a long period of time together. And when we first started speaking to some of the subjects um, of the social dilemma, we were really trying to wrap our heads around, how do you tell the story? Um, and I think for us, the process of nonfiction filmmaking is one of discovery as well. So for the first year or so, the questions were also like, what is the story? What is the problem? What are we trying to talk about here? And um, we knew that this was gonna be a Bay Area heavy film um, because so many of the subjects are in the Bay. Um, we knew that it was gonna be an interview heavy film. Um, and over the course of uh, sort of discovering what the subjects were talking about, we learned more and more about the issues and we were able to figure out this narrative component that we were able to weave throughout the film. Um, we, always, we kept asking ourselves, um, I, I've been hugely inspired by the big short and we kept asking like, what is the documentary version of the big short? Like, how do you flip it upside down? So the big short has these sort of nonfiction elements in a narrative story where they break the wall, they jump in and there's like a, an academic explaining a particular part of the you know economy and then they fly back to the narrative and it continues and um that was hugely inspiring for me in terms of how adam mckay sort of broke the mold um in that storytelling and that was that was an inspiration for how do we do that for documentaries like what's the converse of that and so with this notion of a backbone of a documentary where we could then jump into a narrative story to help guide the viewer through um, that idea really took shape while we were making the movie. Um, so it really started off, um, and, and this is where, uh, with John Barron's based out in uh, Oakland, we knew that so much was gonna happen in the Bay, connected with him, connected with you, we're finding locations and figuring out, okay, we've got this slate of people uh, that we wanted to interview. Um, that's also where I'll just sort of jump ahead a little bit, but um, yeah, yeah. we, we uh, at the time, when we first started those interviews, we didn't know um, about the narrative portions. We didn't have that idea fully formed yet. So we knew this was going to be potentially a heavy talking head film. So we really wanted to think about this in terms of interesting angles, um, lots of camera angles. Some interviews we used as many as six, seven or eight cameras at the start. We kind of got into a groove of the interviews at around five cameras to make it a little bit like five cameras was the low end of uh, feeling a little bit more stable with the interviews. Um, but that's where um, we were able to work with uh, John Barons and yourself and, and others when we were um, doing those early interviews. 
to figure out like how do we create the the mood and the opportunity for interesting visuals while we're um, talking through these interviews. Yeah. So, well, let's talk a bit a little bit about that. Just the um, uh, the discovery aspect of it. I mean, uh, John, uh, when um, when we first met, when I met you guys together and we were in that sort of undressed uh, space that would become the first place where we did interviews, yeah. I was kind of at a loss. I didn't know what was going on really because I knew we were going to be doing, you know, documentary, doing interviews, but here we were talking about like dressing a space with like canvas, painted canvas and, and, you know, creating a, a, a world. And I was like, okay, what's going on here? So I'm wondering, John, what was what was going through your your head? Did you know what was going on? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I met Jeff the first time at Sundance um, uh, when he was there. I believe he was there with Coral, and I was there with um, a film called Racing Extinction. And we met the first time, and we connected very briefly. And then when I heard from these guys later, um, I already knew Jeff was an accomplished DP himself, um, and so we were talking not only like a director and a DP, but like two DPs. And we decided to break the mold of just using the environment as it was and completely create something from scratch for that first series of interviews. And that was all of the, all of the group that was from the Center for Humane Technologies were all going to be in this space that we were pretty much starting from the ground up. Um, so we were standing in a room that looked nothing like what it would ultimately look like, but we were playing with ideas like how theatrical do we want this to look? How, how stylized do we want it to look? How high key, how low key? And so we were sort of playing, bouncing back and forth with all these different ideas and sort of formulating the idea from scratch, which is a rare yeah. thing in documentary. We were Let me just creating talk to that ideas. for a second. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, yeah. we had, um, it was an interesting scenario for us because we had the good fortune, a, a good friend of ours offered a large living room space available to us. Um, and so we had a space that was big enough and moldable enough that we could work with. And so the idea was that we could save a bunch of money by using this space that was made available um, and, and scheduling it for a week of interviews and, and what have you. Um, that quickly sort of unraveled in the thinking um, between uh, the kind of the building of the set, um, which became far more um, expansive than I think we originally anticipated. Um, we were going for the vibe of, you know, the many of the tech startups end up working in these like um, industrial looking office spaces. Um, and that's super common around the Bay Area. So we were wanting to craft that vibe and that style and work with the room that we had available to us to do as much as we could in that one space in the one time. So I actually don't know if this ended up saving us money at the end of the day or costing more, um, but it, it provided a consistent look and vibe for a handful, a good number of the interviews. So I'm happy with those results for sure. And making them look yeah, so unique and, and molding this one space into a lot of different looks and feels. Yes. And I, uh, so maybe back up a little bit, uh, Larissa, uh, you know, here you are being asked to uh, sort of budget for kind of a conceptual thing. Um, what, how did that differ from, say, you know, uh, chasing coral? Well, yeah, all of all of Jeff's projects end up being wild adventures that we think are going to go one direction and end up going in a totally different direction. So it was. Uh, I always try to, to make sure that we're planning ahead for the thing that we don't know we're going to do. But in this case, my biggest concern was actually that <clears throat> these interviews uh, that we created on this set looked beautiful and were amazing, but then we quickly realized we can't get everybody to come to the set and we can't turn the set around enough times to make it look different for all these other interviews, <clears throat> excuse me, for all these other interviews. And so... I think the the magic of this team, everybody on this call and everybody who's not on this call that helped participate was really trying to figure out how do we take the look and the feel of what was created on this stage and be able to replicate that all around the US when we were filming in New York and filming in Colorado and 
different places. So it was certainly a, a production nightmare, in my opinion, uh, with all of the different camera angles. It wasn't just a sit, come sit down and we'll do an interview for an hour. It was a, a massive setup and a massive undertaking every time we did an interview. Yeah, I think that yeah. was one of the challenges too, because every time, okay, we've got five cameras, we need five camera operators. And it, like it kind of grows with itself. Oh, we need more ACs to help build all the cameras. We need more fill in the blank just to manage. So instead of being what we're used to, oh, we can have a three or four person crew to do a two camera interview and run sound yourself and do like a small contained thing. This kind of with every camera, it like increased the size of the crew in a meaningful way. And it's also that much more that you have to dress in terms of the background and light for, because now it's not just one angle. Now you're thinking about the main angle and a profile and a moving shot. And so you've got this like 90 degree arc um, that the cameras are on and the background that you're aiming for. So it just uh, definitely increased our, our prep time. Not easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the challenge of, of uh, not only getting many different interviews in a same space, but then having each one have at least five good frames uh, is, right. is, is, uh, is quite the trick. So yeah. um, maybe you can speak to that a little bit, John. Let me throw one more thought in there, John, and then pass it over to you because we, we started with one particular technique that we tried with Tristan that we kind of morphed away from, which mm -hmm. was uh, at the beginning, we actually really wanted to shoot on both sides of the line. So mm -hmm. we, we used an iDirect. Um, at the beginning, we used more of an Interatron style, but we ended up going to an iDirect for the direct to cameras. Um, and at the start, we wanted to have, the, the idea in my mind at the beginning was having options on both sides of the line with multiple cameras on both sides so that we could use different feelings at different times based on what the subject was talking about. So I was trying to have the flexibility there. But then, first of all, that then created like 180 degree background that you needed to deal with. And it created uh, uh, just lighting that didn't really look as good on the, the lit side of the face. And so we we ended up using that angle, I think, like one time in the movie, very, very um, sparingly. Um, but after that, we we kind of made it more consistent and just stayed on the shadow side of the face um, and kept to, uh, 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 you know, a unit of cameras on that one side. So, John, I'm curious if you had any thoughts on that in terms of like that evolution and, and thinking and process as well. Yeah, I mean, it was I, first of all, it was a wonderfully it was a really fun and, and challenging process. Um, it really helped that Jeff came to the table with a knowledge of the camera. So it wasn't just like this big high concept thing. You had really you had really clear ideas about frames that you wanted to see and how the line worked. And, you know, so we could have these discussions at a higher level. And yeah, we were like, well, let's, I mean, to some extent we were just throwing things at the wall to see what sticks like, all right, well, let's break a rule and put a camera on the key side. And most of traditionally, most tr traditional interviews I shoot, you're shooting the shadow side of the face because it just looks better. It, sh it shapes the face better, but let's try it on both sides. Cause we had a set that would allow that. And we tucked ourselves all the way back. So we had this 180 degree wedge that we could shoot. Um, and yeah. And I never really did like shooting the light side of the face, but we were exploring that. Um, and I think very quickly moved away from it. The other sort of goal was, and I think the eye direct initially was sort of an experiment too. You're like, well, let's try the eye direct and then let's have a traditional camera with traditional eye line off the eye direct so that essentially the eye direct becomes the, the director and the, the off axis camera would be like a traditional setup. So every setup had those two options and you started, Jeff started to fall in love with the eye direct and say, this is really powerful. And we were shooting with a Monstro at 8K. So we had a full frame camera. Most often we were on an 85 millimeter lens doing sort of a waist up. And it gave us the ability to make two sizes of close up and a, and a medium out of that shot. And you could live in just those two frames. But you could also live in an, the whole other setup, which is the off axis, the profile, and the wide. And that's an entirely separate setup that doesn't include the into the camera look. Um, and so you had both options. And then Davis, our editor, started cutting, intercutting all those together, and it looked and felt great. So then all of a sudden it evolved that you're like, well, all bets are off, all rules are, you know, the rules. Besides not breaking the line and shooting the key side of the light, 
pretty much you could cut amongst all those angles. Also, Davis really preferred a pure profile for the, the side camera, like a real profile of one eye, because he could cut via that um, from the into the camera to this camera or, you know, cut from the into the camera to the profile and not have it just feel really awkward. Um, so, that, I mean, yeah, I feel like that was sort yeah. of the process. And what it meant yeah. was that we had to really simplify the lighting because we had, we could have one key, sometimes a backlight and negative fill on the subject. And, and that all had to be very controlled and we couldn't use big keys often. Um, you know, it sort of meant shaping the key more and sometimes even backing it up. With all those different angles, that gives you great cutting, but um, was there more to it? Was, were you working on a metaphor there about, you know, different uh, points of view versus, you know, what social media is doing, narrowing our point of view? Um, that metaphor wasn't in mind, but I'll take that one if, if you're <laughs> offering it. Yeah. But um, well, we, I, just, we definitely talked about voyeurism and so a subject, you know, like some, for sure. Yeah. 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 And there were certain camera feels that um, I remember particularly with Roger McNamee, like we were going for like behind the shoulder, like, like observing over him from behind. And we actually use those uh, to good effect. Um, and we didn't do that too often, like actually not even side profile, but actually behind the person. And that was really, really effective as well. Um, I think part of it though, Luke was kind of saving and using the direct to camera for its greatest potency when we wanted those lines to be delivered like with emphasis. Um, and as, as John was saying, like, because we were using the monster and we had this um, 8K resolution and we can pop into a real tight close up and still have ample resolution there. Like we were really trying in the edit using that very, very sparingly and intentionally for when people are like saying a message directly to you. Um, and, and that was really effective. When did you decide, oh, uh, you know, was it after we were done with the sort of cluster of stuff uh, at the one location? Um, because then you sort of went back, wanted to look at footage for a while, as I understand yeah. it, and then, uh, you know, sort of um, rethink yeah. what goes, what happens next. Uh, when yeah. did the narrative come in? Um, great question. So we had, we probably did, I don't know, Larissa, maybe like a full year of interviews. Yeah. Um, we did a, a, a main cluster in the spring summer of 2018 that we did in the Bay Area. And um, we started editing through all of that. We started finding other subjects in different parts of the country and different experts to bring into the story, um, other former insiders that we were getting access to. So we were doing those interviews over the course of that first year. Um, and it was really like early 2019, so several months in where we started conceiving of this new way to tell the story. I think in part it was like, okay, if we're watching two hours straight of, of talking heads, it was, I don't want to say a slog. I found it massively captivating, um, but it was, I, I think, hard for some audiences to engage um, with wall-to-wall uh, -wall talking heads, um, even as visually dynamic as, as the footage was. And it was during that process where when we were talking with Tristan and Aza and others, we were learning about this um, digital avatar analogy that they had. It's like there's a little digital version of each and every one of us in these systems. And that just became a, a point of conversation that was just hard to sort of shake. Like once we had this idea, we were realizing, we started joking, imagine somebody's there at a control panel puppeteering you as the user. And like Larissa's background right now is a perfect testament to like there was this concept of, oh wait, we're living in the matrix. We actually are living in the matrix right now. And how do we bring that to life and show people that concept? So um, we started thinking through this in early 2019, started writing the script in the summer and we're on this crazy mad timeline um, for Sundance, writing and rewriting the script like up until like we were shooting. Um, and so it was, it was uh, a pretty wild timeline. Um, Jason, who's here, uh, uh, gaffed a, a number of the interviews in Colorado, but then we shot um, all of the narrative stuff. Um, it was shot between Colorado and Los Angeles. So all of the kind of real world stuff was in Colorado, whether in the home or at school, et cetera. And then in LA, we had a soundstage where we shot the sort of AI box world that we built out on the soundstage. 
Um, and that's and where so, the, uh, now, Jonathan Pope DP. Yeah. And so what, what's your connection with, uh, Jonathan? How, how did you guys know each yeah. other? Um, we, uh, we brought on an AD to help guide us through. So Larissa and I, um, uh, we had done narrative work in the past, but not quite at the scale and scope of what we were tackling here. Um, and so we had an AD that we brought on board, um, Travis. Travis, who is phenomenal. Um, and Travis and Jonathan had worked together on a project recently. And it was, it was both the reflection of like wanting a slightly different look and style and then like a huge jumping into the unknown for me and Larissa. And we, it was like a, a team that had already worked together, um, and so we just felt like all the skills and, and the team could come together and collaborate in this really interesting, unique way. Um, and then I remember, I know Jonathan and John had conversations around like how we approach the documentary sections and then how we wanted to approach the narrative sections and uh, talking about very different styles, uh, di very different types of lenses. Um, so Jonathan, I don't know if you want to jump in on some of those thoughts there for your yeah, early I'd, conversation. I'd be interested to hear yeah. uh, what, uh, what kind of, what was going on in those conversations? Because you're you're bringing these two sort of worlds together. Uh, that'd be fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like Jeff said, everything kind of came together very quickly. So um, we were really operating, you know, for the most part, very much on instinct and, you know, just trusting, trusting our gut that these decisions were going to work out, which I think that they did. Um, as Ben's choice goes, um, I had, when they had interviewed me, they had sent me a cut of the film they just had the storyboards in place of the narrative section. So I saw everything that John had shot, which I you know thought was gorgeous. And it was great to kind of see what that interplay was between what he had shot and then where these narrative pieces might go. And the first thought that came into my mind was, well, why don't we try anamorphic? Um, and I remember, I think in our very first uh, call, um, my first call with Jeff, I think I had pitched him anamorphic and I don't, remember Jeff if you had shot anamorphic before so I think you had, I had it. were a little hesitant about it uh well, understandably because it was it's such a departure from what uh was done on the uh documentary side of things um but again we were kind of operating on this like well this you know this feels right in our gut and it felt like a great way to kind of differentiate between the two so when we see we're in the narrative it's a clear distinction between when we're in the documentary uh side of things so um, I had worked, we didn't really have time to do lens tests or camera tests or anything because everything came together very quickly. So I just uh, went with a series of cook anamorphic that I had worked with a number of times in the past and really loved working with. Um, I sent Jeff some test footage with that of things that I had shot and other stuff and he really liked the look and we went from there. Was that single camera? We were predominantly single camera. We had a B camera for like the day at the protest. Um, we had a B camera for the AI section. Um, the B camera was not heavily used, but it was really more to kind of pick up the load if we had a, a really intense day. It really did help at certain, we were on a, we were on a really jam timeline hoping for Sundance um, and uh, in retrospect with COVID this year, we got incredibly lucky <laughs> that we snuck in at the last film festival before the world yeah. flipped upside down. Um, yeah. So in retrospect, uh, thank you, Larissa, for keeping us on that schedule. Um, but uh, but it was an ambitious timeline in large part because we felt like Sundance would have been and, and was and is in my mind, the best festival to have launched this movie in particular for the story that it is and for the audience we were hoping to, to gather with it. Um, so the, the scheduling was ambitious. A couple of things that, that John just referenced there. Um, we had done a, um, after we had the doc roughly cut, we were storyboarding the narrative portions of the film. And we storyboarded the entire 40 page script. And we had one of our assistant editors record voiceover, just description of all of the scenes. And we edited that into the documentary. And this was actually the first real test for us around like, is this, hybrid going to work. Um, another thing that we did, um, we ripped footage from eighth grade. And there was one particular scene with the, a young girl in it um, when we're talking through mental health and the impacts on, on young teenagers. And we, we cut that audio from our experts against the footage from eighth grade just to see it and test. And so that was another really, really strong indicator for us around like, okay, look, a young girl on her phone will play really well as a visual against these ideas that we were learning from our subjects. Um, 
so it was this process of um, using some um, some footage like that just to test the ideas and then the storyboarding to really give us confidence in, is this gonna work for the whole movie? Um, and that's what we were able to share with Jonathan. And also we were able to share with our talent as well. So the actors and actresses were able to watch the whole movie before they ever acted in any of the scenes, which was really um, just interesting and unique and kind of a fun thing for them to be able to take part in. Um, so it was uh, that phase of time where we were trying to figure out how do we um, how do we best pull off this idea and this concept and, and bridge these two worlds together. Uh, we used uh, the Sigma Cine Primes um, mostly for the the documentary interview. So it's a very very clean, uh, sharp, clean glass, um, and that's one of uh, the anamorphic lenses that that Jonathan was referencing. Um, they gave such a different look and feel. Uh, one of the challenges there. Um, that we were aware that we were jumping into, but didn't even quite fully appreciate what how how complicated it was going to be was for the VFX team, and um, being able to do because we had so much over overlays and digital assets that we were working with, um, they had to um, we we calibrated every lens and they were able to get the the characteristics of every lens that we used. And the graphics team had to basically um, uh, correct all of the distortions in the glass and apply their VFX onto it and then reapply the, the characteristics of the lenses back on. So the anamorphic created a beautiful look, but it made things really challenging for the VFX team um, in terms of getting the like a organic look and feel out of a lot of the visuals. One of the unintended consequences <laughs> yeah. of that decision, Jonathan. <laughs> well, I was going to just add that we, we were on like such a tight schedule. I'm glad that we did, but I have to apologize to Jason and the team because I think it was really a challenging uh, set of days to go to move so quickly in the way that Jeff in the doc sort of feeling of we get into the house and being able to scout things in advance, but not having as much time as I'm sure you would have liked to floor plan everything. So I, I think just huge kudos to Jason's team for being able to, <laughs> to light that so quickly. Well, you know, it's funny, um, uh, talking before you were here, uh, Jason was saying that actually, uh, compared to other indie projects, you know, that they've worked on uh, narrative pieces that this felt good. Like you, you guys uh, were, were, uh, um, you, you know, supportive and, and, uh, and it, it felt like a, a good, um, you know, situation on, on set. So, you know, good. I felt the same way, you know, in, with the, the uh, interview stuff, um, uh, you know, ambitious often, you know, crazy ways of needing to uh, load in, you know, equipment into some of those loft locations later on. Uh, but um, always an interesting, uh, worthwhile experience. So uh, I think kudos cool. to you guys just for creating a good atmosphere. Oh, awesome. I wanted to ask Jason what your experience was. We oh. were just like getting into that and um, your experience working with Jonathan and, and with all of us. So the scheduling was so like we were we were basically just several hours ahead of the shooting schedule on a regular basis where Jonathan Pope and I would be reviewing, okay, these are our camera positions the night before. And everything was like just the day before uh, and trying to figure out here's our, here's our floor plan. These are camera positions. This is a rough sketch of the lighting. And so uh, Jason, just kind of curious, like what that um, experience was on your end for this. Um, I think it's interesting because a lot of, you know, I think most gaffers and key groups will always appreciate that we can see that like you and Jonathan or you and jo John are doing the effort to to kind of convey the information to us. I think have been on a lot of projects where you, you get there and, and some, you know, more in commercials where you get there and the, and the DP and director hop off the plane and look at each other and go, what are we shooting today? And then everyone <laughs> kind of has to just fly with that in whatever directions they want to go. Um, which can be really challenging. And then I think with this, it was a lot different because I mean, I think there was a few nights where Jonathan even would email me at you know some hour and we'd be like talking going, okay, cool, we got it, great. I'll see you yeah. in a few hours, <laughs> you know? But, yeah. um, yeah. but you know, it kind of makes it fun when 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 you, I know that you guys are on that page and you two are communicating and we're communicating and, and you kind of get that collaboration and, 
and um, it makes it a lot more, I guess, uh, it's weirdly makes it a lot easier when we're kind of in that same flow with that same direction we're trying to go in the same, um, you know, and all have that same knowledge in our pocket of, of what we're trying to achieve. And, and I know you guys are under the gun. So I think uh, for my crew, we all appreciated that. It's like, Hey, you know what? Like we're busting it, but those guys obviously stayed up pretty late busting it. So we know what we're doing today. Uh, and um, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> so it's, it's not. Nice. It cool. I would never uh, vouch for having too much prep time, but sometimes what that can do is just allow you the opportunity to overthink your decisions mm -hmm. and just get stuck in your head about things. So we didn't have that luxury. We were, we just had yeah. to be on it all the time. So, you know, going back to what I said before, just having to trust our gut. Like, you know, Jeff would sometimes come to me with, with an idea the night before, sometimes even the morning of, and we're like, that sounds great. Let's do it. You know, and it was a lot of that kind of synergy that we had to have. When you don't have the luxury of time, you're just like, this is what we're doing. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, I don't feel bad anymore. You all just made me feel great about the schedule. <laughs> Damn, like, this is how Larissa is going to schedule everything now. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, I heard that you, uh, the night before every shoot, that you would get together with Jeff and then you would draw a lighting diagram for the next day. Do you want yeah, to talk pretty about much that? We had tried to, um, the week before shooting, Jeff and I had tried to meet uh, as much as we could to do, to kind of get through as much of the shot list and planning as, as possible. But I know Jeff is being pulled in a million different directions. So it was hard to find time to shot list everything. So we did as much as we could before. And I, I like to do just, you know, diagrams and overheads for each scene, especially if the blocking gets complicated so I can kind of understand all right, where our opportunities to put lights and, you know, can we combine these shots? Because it's different seeing a list versus seeing it laid out overhead. Um, so I tried to do those for every scene. And then I would send those to Jason ahead of time. Um, but you're right. It, it did get to a point where we were kind of like, We'd come back exhausted, eat dinner, and then stay up really late that night planning the next day and drawing diagrams. And uh, I'd send those off to Jason, and we'd get we'd get moving the next day. It was a, it was a fun process. It was intense, but it yeah. was fun. And I think we got into a groove at a certain point. After a couple yeah. days, it was like, all right, this is... And I'm with you completely, Jonathan. Um, uh, a shot list, in my mind, doesn't do justice to just the diagrams and, and a map and having the decisions on all right, we're going to use this lens over here from that position and we can get all these shots from this side of the room together um, right. and then we'll flip the room and then we'll blah, blah, blah. And um, it just, I, I think we're all such visual people that being able to put it onto a map like that is just so incredibly helpful. And now that was just drawn or was that on a program or something? We used oh, an I app. Did, yeah, I designer. used my iPad. I've got like an Illustrator version on, on iPad that I just drew out the diagrams on. Jonathan, had you worked with Jason before? No, I hadn't actually. No. So none of you guys had really worked together before, but here you were coming off a plane. You were coming from LA to Colorado. And, uh, um, and then, so uh, that just speaks to professionalism and, uh, and also the, the good work of Travis, was it, who, who got you guys yeah. together? Yeah. Travis did a, a phenomenal job. And I think also Larissa and I had the good privilege of having, uh, or basically um, the relationships with everybody. So we'd work with Jason for years on different projects and knew his style and groove. And I had no qualms whatsoever. I knew Jonathan and Jason would work together well as, as like everybody on this team. Um, it was always just this, this clear mindset that uh, the team was going to gel in a really, really strong way. Huge ahead, shout out uh, to Daniel and uh, our uh, my other co-producer and, and Stacey, an amazing Sarah. production, you know, co-production. And it was, yeah, just like an, an incredible team came together. It was a Herculean effort, I think, Sarah and <laughs> Stacy especially. Larissa, uh, for uh, budgeting, how different was that, uh, you know, just uh, from a producer's perspective than what you had been working on uh, with the interviews? Yeah, I mean, honestly, you know, sometimes narrative is easier to budget for, in my opinion, than documentary, because you don't necessarily know where the documentary is going to go, what the characters are going to do. They end up flying to Europe and all of a sudden you now have to be producing in Europe. And um, so I think on, on one side, it seems easier because you think you know what the script is and what's going to happen. And then you get on set and you start filming things. And then because of a location change or because we're running behind or because there's a, uh, you know, a fire alarm that gets pulled and you have oh, to get... Man 
leave okay, so. school yeah, and everybody yeah, has to I evacuate and uh you know you get you, you just have to kind of ch plan for the unexpected in that sense too so i found that uh it's not so different budgeting for documentary than narrative because the unexpected always happens no matter what you're working on how many days think, were you actually working on the narrative we did two two weeks of, of filming we did one uh, basically one week in colorado and then one week um, in LA, but uh, there was prep time before that and set building before that. Um, but it, it really was a bit of kind of John Pope, Jonathan Pope walking off the plane with, get, with the lenses. <laughs> I think you brought the lenses, thank goodness. Yeah. Um, one of them I think ended up, we, we lost the lens. It wasn't one our got fault. Stolen. Got stolen. Oh, that so. was the, the right? reshoot we had, or not the reshoot, yeah. the pickup day we had in Colorado. The pickup day, yeah. So yeah. have insurance. Again, I just tell everyone have insurance, but. <laughs> Yes, it, it was a, a, a pretty amazing effort to, to watch this team work together. But also just oh, goes awesome. to the, the risks of flying with really expensive lenses. Yeah. Was that stolen on the flight or like in the tra during the travel? Uh, no, There's... it was. That was put through cargo and, and somewhere along the way it got taken. Wow. Yeah. The case made it through. The content of the case didn't oh. make it through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I've heard stories of, but now we lived it. Um, I wasn't. Gonna, I just wanted to share briefly that we were referencing the fire alarm earlier, and we we had, it was like the tail end of our production in Colorado. This it was a Saturday. We were filming at a school, a couple of different scenes. Um, one scene that didn't even make it into the film ultimately, and then Sunday we had like uh, the all the protest footage, and that, the Sunday was like our last big day. And we're there on the school on Saturday, and we're getting to the end of the day, and. There was a fire alarm that went off um, that really, really handicapped us for, for like hours. And we're out there outside of the building, unable to, uh, unable to shoot. And it was gonna, it was eating into our time for the day and how much time we had before we had to start the next day. And we had to just like completely on the fly rethink what we were gonna be able to pull off that evening. Um, had to scrap a bunch of shots. It, it became a little bit more rushed, but we were able to pull off everything that we needed to do and start the next day a little bit later. But that it's one of those things, like that one particular event just created this domino of, of consequences where um, Sunday when filming the protest, we were also like the whole day was jammed. We were racing the clock. We were racing the, the sunset around how do we get all the uh, shots in that we need before uh, the sun goes down. Um, we actually were able to squeeze one little last pickup that was an essential shot where we did, uh, we were able to do a, um, a night for day shot, um, uh, like a close yeah, up Jason, in the car. You, to Jason said talk about that because I'm always amazed by that movie magic because we lost the light and the storm was coming, but you made it, you made it match. Yeah, that was a we, challenging yeah. setup. I don't think we were really going in ready to be doing that so it was kind yeah. of uh, let's pull yeah. something out of our i think john and i kind of got together and we're like so <laughs> well we should give was... context to what this shot was it's the moment when the older sister sees the brother in the protest and what mm -hmm. we realized as we were looking at what we had shot was we never had anything really on her eye line seeing him everything was kind of detached from her eye line so we just didn't know if in the edit it would register that she sees him because that's such a pivotal moment so we decided we just need right. a close up through the window of her registering that he's there um and, it, and by that point the sun had gone down so we had to put our hands but, together well, and figure out how to make that happen i remember part part of the thinking there was like before the sun had gone down we were like trying to get through our shot list racing the clock navigating like a hundred extras for this protest right. scene um and doing that we, we had two cameras for all of that um and and trying to, we realized we were missing this one perspective, but that we weren't going to have the time to capture it. So we we prioritized everything that we needed um, that was wide, um, and everything that needed the sun. And we were like, okay, this we can pick this up afterwards, um, right. and we can recreate, um, uh, we can recreate the lighting for that particular shot. So we sort of carved that one out and kept doing everything that required the sun, um, and raced all of that in, and then. Um, then we're able to do a dinner break and then reset for that that one shot. Yeah, I think I remember. Yeah. Jeff, I think we had a conversation. We were like, "Hey, we might need to do a thing with that. That still needs to be a day." And I'm kind of looking around, go, "Uh oh." All right. Never I walked over to the key group, and he and I, I was like, "We we can pull it off, man. We can do this." I don't, yeah. And then I remember I walked over to Dylan, the 
Dylan Rumney, the key grip, and I kind of went, okay, man, so we got it, and he kind of gives me this. But yeah. Kind of, okay, we can do it. Let's figure it out. So we – Yeah. Uh, Tried to keep you, it Jason. contained. I mean, what, what did you guys do? You threw up a twelve by. Yeah, we put it, which was just the biggest overhead we had, which was just a twelve by. Yeah. Made a big bounce over the top and had the M40 going into that to just kind of lift that ambience to give it a more of a daytime feel. And I think, um, and again, a lot of bounces in to just try and lift everything. And then right. we, with Jonathan and I, we were able to kind of very strategically position some of the the protesters with signs to kind of hide the fact that, you know, the sky is black and, right. the, and some of the background was a lot darker than we could manage. So we kind of were right. able to contain the space down enough to pull it off. I, I remember watching it when we kind of went, Hey, we actually pulled that off. Sorry. It looked <laughs> great. You, nobody can tell. It is so <laughs> seamless. It I didn't notice. Like, <sighs> yep. It, it worked well, really, really well. That's actually pretty good because uh, isn't there an analogy uh, with the social dilemma about magic? <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean that's. Um, I uh, I have a deck of cards here somewhere. I actually have been doing a whole bunch of card tricks lately on Zoom calls because <laughs> of this uh, magic theme. But um, I think that's one of the things that I always just loved about filmmaking is that it is it's all just a whole bunch of magic tricks that you're trying to pull all the time. And how do you how do you convince the viewer of a particular um, story that you're trying to convey, whether it's the ideas or the um, or the camera tricks. Um, maybe maybe you all can talk about the fact that some of the interviews were green screened. And I mean, originally, Jeff, you wanted mm. to have a, a meta magic trick in the film, which we didn't end up including. Oh. But uh, the fact that we did green screen those interviews, I think, was a challenge for you know the colorists and, and all sorts of things, but also just a very interesting way to conduct an interview. So here's one of the things that, that John did that uh, I have never done before, but when we finished wrapping Tristan's um, interview, uh, John Barron's went and he shot plates and just took measurements of all the cameras and angles and positions. And I was, at first I was like, this is a lot of extra work. And then I was like, okay, this actually could be really, really useful. And so we did this for every interview was and made Luke's, sure we had- Luke's lighting plan also. The lighting plan we mapped out um, the camera positions, lensing, distances, heights. Um, but the biggest, the most necessary thing was just having good clean plates from every camera angle. We tried for some of the moving cameras that turned out to be a little bit more complicated. Um, but uh, for all the static camera positions, just to have a good clean plate. If um, sometimes we had like a Canon 70 to 200 zoom lens on, so getting a couple different focal lengths for different plates for wide or tight. Um, and it turned out that with Tristan and then with one other subject, Tim Kendall, we actually wanted to shoot some pickups. And we had the option of just doing a new interview in a new setting, or because we had these plates already captured, we had the option of putting them back in the same room. So what we ended up doing um, in, a number, in, in those cases with Tristan and Tim Kendall was we had them dressed in the same clothing, tried to match their hair as, as accurately as possible, and then basically just um, did a green screen set up to match the original settings um, to be able to put them back in that same room. So um, they're they're seamless in the final version of the film. Um, it took a while for, for that to work out, but um, John, I'm curious, had you done that before? Is this something that was was common for you or? Um, I, I, had done, I had done it on a smaller scale. Um, and once again, what a, a great tribute to you guys. Um, you asked if this was possible and I said, well, it is. Um, if we, we have to shoot plates and we have to do really good metrics of the lighting diagram, lensing, every camera position. And you guys actually listened and followed through on every setup. We did that on every setup that we shot throughout the film. So we had this great bank of plates and metrics that we could then go later and recreate any of the interviews. So I had done that in the past on single camera stuff, but I had never done um, recreations on green screen with five cameras, which complicated everything as well. And we also, on the green screen, we brought in onset compositing. So we brought the plates with us to the green screen, put up all the plates, composited every single camera and made sure that it matched. And then AB'd between the practical onset interview and the composite just to make sure we were close. One of the best examples there was, um, uh, so Tim Kendall, we did his interview um, in his, uh, at his house. And 
nine months later, a year later, he emails me and Larissa and says, you know what? I have a lot of new thoughts in this since we did our conversation and my thinking has evolved. Um, and both the prodding that we encouraged during the interview and then his subsequent conversations, he was like, I have a lot more to say now. Um, and we, we kind of chatted with him and wanted to, you know, see what was going through his mind. And we realized, you know what, this is, this is worth doing. And I, I don't know, from a style perspective, we easily could have just put him in a new location. Um, but I do find it somewhat inconsistent with documentaries sometimes where you see somebody just pop into different rooms and different settings. Um, and the notion that we had the opportunity to keep the look visually consistent, it just seemed like, why wouldn't we? Um, and it was a real value add. Um, so it was something that, that proved to be really, really useful. Um, one challenge on that, just in terms of the, uh, the green screening um, aspects of it, we tried a couple different things with, um, with shutter speeds and with blur. So if you increase your shutter speed so that you get a cleaner key, you then have to add back in motion blur in post after you do the keying and the compositing. So it just creates like, yeah, uh, either you get a better key, but it requires more work on the back end to get the motion blur to come back, or you shoot with a 180 degree shutter and then the key isn't necessarily as clean. So there were challenges on all fronts. Um, we worked with Will Cox um, at Final Frame in New York and he and his team are just phenomenal. And they put the time and dedication into like getting them perfect, picture perfect. And we spent so much time analyzing, okay, what's the best way for us to um, really mask. Uh, and, um, I was particularly anal about some of it. It was like, we can see the artifacting or you can see when the key isn't super clean or what have you, but those were um, challenges that they really, really were able to address well. Jeff, what did you settle on in terms of shutter? You know, what, it, what, what did you feel after that experience? Was it better to have a higher I, shutter? You know, the thing, so uh, the thing I regret that we didn't do, we, we didn't keep um, uh, kind of rim light or hair lights consistent because uh, it made it for an easier key in some cases. That was a thinking, that was a thing that I missed. Them. Like when cutting back and forth, it's like the lighting is, sorry, I don't know if we're allowed to, like the lighting was inconsistent and it was dry. Like that's where the, the, the fill and the, hair lights being slightly inconsistent were really challenging for me. And I had to do a lot of work with Will to like burn in, like sometimes we put in more fill um, in the, uh, in the sec, in, in the pickup. So my, my lesson learned there is like, just actually make the lighting as consistent as you can in terms of all of the shaping on, on the face. Um, and that the keys are good enough now. I mean, if you're using a really, really good camera, the keys are clean. So I, I, I would say, and, and I'd like to talk to Will more around like his take on this, but my gut would be um, stick to a higher shutter so you get a clean key and you have to put in a little bit of motion blur afterwards. Um, but that uh, keeping the lighting actually as accurate and as similar as possible would be the best vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember one of the challenges because we were doing five cameras are wide meant that we couldn't have as much garbage matting. Uh, we couldn't we couldn't choke in with neg fill and black around the green as much as we normally would have. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe we made a choice to use more fill to make up for the fact that we had a lot more green around him. Mm -hmm. So that that was definitely one of the challenges from the from the perspective of working practically with so many angles. Um, cause I remember we had this, you know, this funny little peninsula yeah. of green that, that, um, Tristan was sitting on and the black was choked right into the edge of the wide frame yeah. in a way that it didn't cross him. Um, but yeah, that's a good note is like, still stick with the, stick with the most consistent, um, yeah. lighting. And I think the, the things that bothered me and having to go through the color, they're like, nobody else is noticing or seeing whatsoever, no one no one but, noticed. um, but it's the, uh, it's for us to geek out about when we're in the, in the color suite. So I'm wondering, since we don't have that much time with you and, uh, with Jeff and uh, Larissa, I'm wondering if I could ask you guys just a few more questions and then if the other guys are willing to stay on, we can get into more, uh, uh technical aspects about cameras and lights. Um, if that's cool with everybody. Jeff, if you could speak to just the difference in directing different types, you know, narrative, uh, interview, um, even the 
you know, the st stuff in LA, we're, you know, adding in the CGI kind of stuff, and then um, uh, also uh, directing animation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love all of it personally. Um, and narrative is kind of how I first got into filmmaking um, back in college. Um, so in many ways, it was like a refreshing, like um, throwback to where filmmaking started for me. Um, and the, the biggest difference is that when you're working with, uh, when you have a script and you're working with actors, it's like, no, we're here to get this shot and this thing and you can, you can shape and morph all of it versus when you're with nonfiction subjects, when you're with documentary subjects, you're really not trying to influence. Like I really try to step back, like sit down interviews are one thing where we're having a conversation, but if you're following somebody, you know, in city streets and in the halls of Congress and what have you, you're, you're really in fly on a wall mode um, and not trying to interfere. And if you miss the moment, you miss the moment and you just keep trying to catch up with it. So I feel like it, there are, are different mindsets for those styles of filmmaking, at least for me. Um, uh, animation, I, I really just enjoy as a, as a style and as an opportunity um, to really be creative with what you're trying to convey and communicate. So that's been, um, it's fun just to blend what are the right tools and what are the right methods for storytelling for a particular film or a particular moment in a film. Um, this one I, I think was uh, interesting and fun in that we got to play with a lot of different styles within one movie. Um, and so it, it's just a, I don't know, it's, what, what's the right um, tool for the job? The original batch of foundational interviews that we did, you know, at the one location, um, then when we went out, beyond that to uh, other, uh, you know, loft spaces mm -hmm. and stuff like that, we seem to get sort of a little lighter and airier. I mean, just because of windows, whatever. Yeah. Was that a conscious choice? Um, in some cases it was very conscious. I, one of the things I'm trying to remember what we were trying to do for a while was to keep the insiders from the companies within like darker spaces, but then the academics and the, um, commentators who were adding to the conversation that, that weren't from the companies, they were in somewhat lighter spaces as well. Um, for the doctors, we were trying to keep them in a more kind of clean and, and white, like whiter environment. Um, certainly for the people who were um, talking about uh, mental health um, and, and it really depended. It's this chicken and egg between like the hopes and intentions and style versus the practical, this is the only location that's available on the day that the subject is available. Um, and so you're, you're balancing all of those things out, but those are the rough kind of um, guiding thoughts that we had in mind. One of the revolutionary things you guys should talk about a little bit is that rather than just saying, okay, where's your office? We're going to go there. You found spaces on peer space and would really do a uh, remote, lo like virtual location scouting. Yeah. yeah. We, I think props to, to Daniel and we had a couple of other location scouts that helped us, but really trying to give the sense of what is this space? Um, where could the lights go? Where are the windows? What could we cover? What, you know, for, for John um, and for his team and for Jason as well, just being able to, to be able to say, this is what kind of elements we're going to have to deal with in these locations. And then of course you plan everything and everything goes out the window because all of a sudden there's a crane or construction or buses backing up. Um, but, but I think it really oh, was trying man. to figure out, you know, scouting out the best locations that we thought would be able to fit the style of what we had already done before. And I think to, to Jeff's point, like really trying to figure out what would match the character and, and not wanting to make it so that we were just like you said, in their office or anywhere, but we would want to try to be as convenient because these were very busy people. So it was definitely a, a cat and mouse game of trying to find a space that was close enough that would still match the style of everything else. Yeah, I think what Larissa said there, like matching the character. Um, Bailey Richardson from Instagram is in a place that feels very Instagrammy, and Tim Kendall from Pinterest is like it, his his uh, a camera shot looks like a Pinterest frame in many ways, and so it was trying to match the moods um, in in many ways of what the characters are bringing. And this is a film that it's not. Um, it's less about them as characters. So it didn't even make sense in many ways to interview them in their own homes. It wasn't a matter of like, who are they um, following them as a person? It was about these ideas and about these companies. So it was really like, what's the space that, um, that makes sense for the story in relation to their role to the story.
and what space will hold five cameras because most people's houses right. or offices wouldn't be able right. to accommodate right. that style. <laughs> Some people were like, come film me in my house. And, and we're like, oh, send us photos of your living room. And it's like, we can't fit like, and then we would show a photo of like, this is what our last setup was like. I don't think you want this in your living room. Um, and so that, that definitely is a complication. And as you said, John, um, uh, peer space turned out to be a really valuable resource for us. Um, one of the challenges though is audio. And so some of the spaces look great. And then we would try to send a, a location scout to go check them in person and realize, wait a second, these are really, really in windows and there's construction outside or the number of times we had, we were in one location where just on a fluke, they were washing the windows that day. And there was a crane and window washers like scheduled throughout our interview and we couldn't do anything about it. And they weren't. Um, with power washers. With power washers. With, we got them to power. Yeah. Yeah. They took and it was 100 crazy. degrees inside, and too. There was no air conditioning in that. It was like we had to get ice packs for our talent just to, like, keep them cool so they weren't just dripping sweat on camera. That was the air conditioning is helpful. <laughs> that was that was the most torturous was interview crazy. day. Uh, yeah. Our yeah, hard day. Yeah. I think I need to uh, let you guys go unless... Uh, you can stay on, but um, I actually think I think I, think I can I, stay on. I think we or both have we... to hop off for. Uh, OK, so hold on. That's the producer and the director. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I want to just keep Classic. chatting, but there is I am we seeing something on the calendar. Um, <laughs> Sorry, well, thank Luke. you so much, Luke. Thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm I kind of just want to eavesdrop in on the rest of the conversation to hear what, what you're all talking about. But thank you so much, Luke. Thank you so I much. I really appreciate you guys taking the time. And uh, yeah, um, you know, good luck with uh, continuing on with this project because I know there's there's webinars and stuff. I've been watching them. Uh, they're cool. really great yep. uh, awesome. about Thank the content. You. And um, so good luck on all your next projects. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Talk later, Wonderful guys. team. All right. Best team. Bye-bye. Bye. Right on. Well, uh, good to meet you guys. Hope to see you uh, down the road and uh, thank all of you for uh, watching and we'll see you again next time. <laughs>